So I think it's not necessary to introduce him because he's extremely famous, but uh, just let me quickly introduce him. So he uh, got a PhD uh, on 2003 uh, in Germany, and then uh, he uh, did a postdoc at Caltech and Perimeter, and now uh, he is a professor at the University uh, of British Columbia. So of course, uh, his uh, main research uh, achievement is a uh, uh, foundation of measurement-based quantum computation. So uh, mathematically, this is equivalent to circuit model, but conceptually, this is completely new. So it uh, brought a completely new idea in quantum computing, and not only in quantum computing, also uh, this measurement-based quantum computation affect a uh, broad uh, field like condensed matter physics, statistical physics, and even in cryptography. So for example, uh, measurement-based quantum computation has a connection to AKLT model in condensed matter physics or tensor network. And also uh, this uh, measurement-based quantum computation provides some nice framework for uh, high threshold for torrent quantum computation. And also a uh, partition function of classical Ising model is related to measurement-based quantum computation. And also uh, blind quantum computing, which is a quantum cryptographic protocol, uh, can be uh, uh, found uh, based on the idea of uh, measurement-based quantum computation, because measurement-based quantum computation provides clear separation between classical and quantum. And finally, uh, this uh, measurement-based quantum computation is also important in quantum supremacy, because, for example, this measurement-based quantum computation uh, IQP circuit is a special case of this measurement-based quantum computation. And by using a picture of measurement-based quantum computation, we can also study uh, quantum supremacy. So in this way, this uh, MBQC is uh, one of the most central topic in uh, recent quantum information. And now uh, I'm very uh, pleased to uh, listen uh, to uh, uh, Robert's talk uh, about uh, this measurement-based quantum computation. OK, uh, so please start. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your very kind introduction. Um, uh, maybe I should start with a complainer. I'm, I'm uh, not a, a disclaimer. I am uh, giving this talk for the very first time, uh, or at least the, the part that is new in this talk, I'm giving for the various, very first time. Uh, and so I don't know if one should do this in a colloquium, but here I am. So. Okay, so let me begin. So here's an outline of my talk. So the first two parts of it uh, will be a review of a background material. So I will begin with the scheme of measurement based quantum computation. And then I will talk about the subject of computational phase of math. So this is where you get when you take measurement based quantum computation to condensed matter physics. And so then the new element in my talk today. Uh, is a gauge theory of measurement based quantum computation. And the underlying thread that combines all these elements is symmetry. Yeah? So, it, as it turns out, and we have begun to discover this uh, over the last couple of years, symmetry is very essential for the working of measurement based quantum computation. It's essentially, symmetry tells essentially all about the computational scheme. Okay, and we are, we are figuring this out little by little. Much of this you see down here when you talk about so-called computational phase of quantum matter, but it seems that gauge theory is another angle on this theme of symmetry and maybe a useful point to make. And that's why I'm talking about it today. All right, let's get started. Let me begin with uh, part one, which is on measurement-based quantum computation. All right, and so the basic idea here is that there are certain states out there in the world, for example, the two-dimensional cluster state that are like computational materials. And so this means you can just have this thing, you can uh, create it, or get it in the store, and then it is like a blank sheet of paper for you to implement quantum computation by local measurements. So you can measure every particle in this state, and it means you can choose a measurement basis uh, for every site that you measure and by choosing that measurement basis you tell the state uh, what to compute for you and then you post process all your measurement outcomes and that gives you the result of the computation okay so uh, well that means uh, quantum states can have computational power of course this wouldn't work for 
for most quantum states, but there are some for which it does. Okay. And so just kind of to back up even more, uh, the, the computational power in this scheme is harnessed by measurements. So all that ever happens is you get the state and then you measure the individual particles. Yeah? That, that, that's all really there is. There's no unitary evolution in this computational scheme. Good. And so now let me clarify the distinction. So there's two extreme ways of evolving quantum states. There is unitary evolution and there's projective measurement. They're very different from, from one another. So measurement uh, is, let me begin with unitary transformation. It is deterministic and reversible. So you, you know exactly what you are doing and you can undo it. Uh, projective measurement is different. It is probabilistic. So a measurement invokes an outcome and that is random. And once you have measured, it is impossible to go back to the state just before the measurement. So that state is lost uh, for all times. Okay, so these are really quite different operations, but it turns out they both work for quantum computation. So you can build quantum computation on those. This gets you to the circuit model and you can build it on those and that gets you to the measurement based model. By the way, uh, I think probably there's no questions yet, but whenever you have a question, please do not hesitate to ask it. So let's see. Yeah, so please uh, raise your hand whenever you have a question. I, I'd be happy to explain. All right. Good. Okay, so with this introductory remark, um, let's look at the scheme from a bird's eye view. So again, you have your quantum state, your computational resource, and now you, are, you can think of it as imprinting a quantum circuit on that state by the one local measurements. And so you see various symbols here, and those symbols denote various measurement bases. So to, give, to illustrate this a little bit and uh, help you figure out what's going on, let me tell you what those measurement bases are. Uh, so the Z measurement is denoted by a dot. And what happens whenever you measure a cluster qubit, if this is a cluster state, whenever you measure one of these qubits, you effective, effectively remove it. So it is as if those qubits have, had never been there. Uh -huh. And so what you see after you've done that, you end up with a kind of net-like structure. Yeah? And indeed, you have now uh, uh, projected out a quantum circuit. And so these horizontal lines, they can indeed be thought of as wires for quantum information, where you are uh, teleporting quantum information along from left to right while also processing it. So these, uh, these uh, measurements in non-standard bases uh, involving a rotation angle in the measurement basis, uh, they implement one qubit rotations. Otherwise, you're just shuttling information from left to right. And then you have these bridges between two such quantum wires. And they represent entangling gates, as it turns out. So you can do logical C knots and so on and so forth. OK, good. So I've now given you a few details. But the, the bird's eye viewpoint is that information is written onto this resource state and processed on it and then read out from it by the one qubit measurements alone. And there's various types of quantum states uh, with which you can do this. And the AKLT state is an example, cluster state is another example. But, uh, yeah. So this was the bird's eye view. And so now let me, um, so basically what I have done here is I, you know, I've been, I've drawn you something that looks like a quantum circuit. So I have mapped measurement-based quantum computation. I mean, at least at a kind of not very detailed way, but I have mapped the measurement-based model to the circuit model. I have tried to explain this to you in terms of quantum circuits. Uh, and, and what I wanna now present is the fact that this has limits. So there are, there are certain aspects of measurement-based quantum computation that don't fit 
the circuit simulator viewpoint very well. And I wanna, um, I wanna explain to you one of these. This is a very old argument. This is from 2001, I think. And I call it, never mind the upward comparison, I call it the uh, elevator thought experiment of measurement based quantum computation. So uh, <clears throat> let me tell you what this is about. Um, so the first thing that we have to acknowledge here is that once the computation is over, every qubit here in this state has been measured. So at the end of the day, all you have left is a product state, which is useless for any further computation and a bunch of measurement outcomes. And the goal of the computation now, of the remainder of the computation is to classically post-process all these measurement outcomes in such a fashion that you are extracting a computational output. So this is the first thing to say, uh, measurement-based quantum computation is about uh, extracting a computational output from a measurement record. So this is, you wanna get few bits from a very large number of bits yeah, that represent the measurement record. And so the interesting thing is that individually, each outcome that you measure here on the cluster is random. So information is only contained in the correlations among those various measurement outcomes. And so the question is, which form, which shape do these correlations take? And that is what we now want to uh, investigate a little bit, okay? So now here comes this uh, elevator thought experiment for measuring this computation. So if you come from the circuit model perspective, um, then you could subdivide your cluster into three regions. You could say, okay, at the beginning of the computation is the preparation. So the leftmost column of your cluster state is for preparing a quantum register in, in its initial state. Then comes the gate region. All these qubits are used to implement transformations. And then there's a final region at the right boundary of the cluster, which represents the logical measurement um, of the, the quantum register. Okay, so you could say from this circuit model perspective that these different regions on the cluster, they have different function. And so you wonder, does this mean that uh, you know, the other perspective was at the end of the day, it's just measurement outcomes and you identify certain correlations and well, you put out in computational output. So the question is, do these three regions um, contribute in different way to your computational output? Yes, the uh, circuit model perspective would suggest it, but do they? And the answer is no, they don't. Every measurement result, irrespective of where in the cluster it was measured, it, um, it contributes in the same fashion. Yeah, so, the, it's, so this distinction between the two regions, between the three regions, uh, it, doesn't, it isn't really there. Okay, so uh, what you rather have is what we call the classical uh, side processing relations of measurement-based quantum computation. So there's, there are, <clears throat> they come in two varieties. So one I have already mentioned. Uh, the point here is to take this measurement record and convert it into computational output. And, and you see the correlations that do that, they take a, a fairly simple form. This is all linear algebra modulo two. So what you do is you take your, uh, your vector of measurement outcomes, yeah, so the the, the measurement outcome for every qubit stacked together in a vector, you apply a matrix to it and you convert this long vector into a very short vector and that represents a computational output, okay? So it's a very, very simple relationship. Um, okay, and so um, th this is the relation that I will be mostly dealing with. Um, but I cannot shuffle under the rug There's, that there is another such relation, um, namely measurement-based quantum computation has temporal order and the, where it, even though the measurements that you do all commute. 
And the reason that this is so is that measurement bases need to, of the, of the individual qubits, measurement bases need to be adjusted to measurement outcomes that have been obtained before. And uh, well, so that is just a fact of measurement based quantum computation. And uh, I will later explain a little bit how it comes about. Um, but the adaption is very simple. So for every qubit, there's two, two choices of measurement basis. So once you have fixed an angle, that is part of the description of the algorithm you want to run. So there's just one angle. And then the adaption is you're flipping between two bases of measurement. Yeah? So, and they are, they are, they are uh, located symmetrically about uh, the x-axis on the block sphere. Okay, so it, it turns out that this is the adaption that you need to do. And again, uh, so which basis to choose is described by one bit. And these bit values you can again stack as a vector. And there's again a mod two linear relation that converts measurement outcomes into uh, these adaptions of measurement bases. Okay, so everything is governed by parities as these equations uh, illustrate. I will, in the next few slides, I will tell you a little bit how these relations come about or how they can be understood in, in the circuit model. Okay, so, so we now know it. This was the point of, of this exercise. All the qubits, just the measurement outcomes from everywhere, they contribute in the same way here to parities. Um, and so now we have, we have these equations, which are kind of in a mechanical way describe us what is, what, what is going on and allow us to, uh, to run the computation. But what is missing at this point is kind of a, a higher level picture. And this higher level picture is put in by, by this gauge theory that I will be describing. So we know that um, at least in one dimension, which is a very special case, um, we can regard the measurement record as a gauge field and um, each bit of the computational output we can regard as a holonomy of this gauge field, okay? So this is the end of my talk. This is what I want uh, to show to you. Good. Yeah. But uh, to, uh, to uh, put this into a bit of context, um, I, um, I wanted to tell you more about how symmetry uh, is important for measurement based quantum computation. Good. So, but before we get to that, this computational phase of quantum matter, let me show you a little bit how these relations come about, how you can, how they can be understood from the circuit model. Okay. So, here is the circuit model. So, we are now moving from dimension two to dimension one. We will spend a considerable amount of time of this talk in dimension one. Dimension one is always simpler. At any rate, so you have a 1D cluster state here and the circuit model uh, view on this computation is as follows. Yeah? So you have five qubits here in this case. Uh, the circuit model in, uh, interpretation is that for the five qubits, you have five operations. You can do five rotations, they are alternating about the z-axis and about the x-axis, z-axis again, x-axis, and so on and so forth. Five cluster qubits, five rotation. Every measurement gives rise to one such rotation. And all of this is preceded by uh, preparation in an eigenstate of sigma x and followed by a measurement in the x basis. So this is the circuit model interpretation of the measurement-based computation that happens on this cluster. Okay, but measurement outcomes are random. And so the, these random outcomes need to have an effect. And so here is what this effect is. So if you choose the measurement angle right, you always implement uh, one part of your operation deterministically. So this is the rotation that you wanted. But now, depending on what the outcome was, whether you measured the positive or the negative eigenvalue, um, you find that you get extra bits. You get these, what we call Pauli operators. So these are random but heralded bits in your computation. So you, 
You have them even though you don't want them. Yeah, but there's nothing you can do about it. Measurement outcomes are random. And in the circuit model view, they produce these byproduct operators. And so now the question is, how do you get rid of them? How do you get rid of them? And the way you get rid of them is by propagate them forward in the circuit past the readout measurement. So everything that happens after the readout measurement is, is immaterial. You know? And so as soon as you can propagate them out, you're, you're, you're fine. But let's see what happens in this propagation. So first, look at this pairing here. So you have this byproduct, uh, which is of Z type, and you have this rotation, which is of X type. So they do not commute. So when you exchange the order, which is what we do, we just kind of move step by step, uh, something is going to happen. And uh, yeah, so what is going to happen is you conjugate this unitary under the byproduct. And so this acquires a minus sign here in this, in this angle. And then you move on. Next rotation is of Z type. So it commutes through, then it fails to commute again, flips an angle and so on and so forth. The last thing that happens is um, you move it past uh, an X readout measurement. And so it flips the measurement outcome. This is also important. So the, the measurement outcome on the last qubit needs to be corrected by all these byproducts that occur on the way. Yeah, and this is an effect of this byproduct operator propagation. Okay, uh, I hope that made some sense um, and gave you a feeling for how these classical side processing relations come about. So the basic effects are whenever you have a byproduct operator, as you propagate it out, you're flipping angles of rotations. Now, when you later measure uh, the corresponding measurement angles, you have to compensate for that flip. And this is how measurement bases are adapted to measurement outcomes obtained earlier. Okay, so hopefully you can see at some level how these linear processing relations come about. Okay, what I have introduced here are the byproduct operators. So byproduct operators are a very important notion uh, for measurement based on computation. Good. Just wanted to, to say that. And so this concludes my summary of measurement based quantum computation. And I now want to move on uh, and talk about computational phases of quantum matter. But maybe I should pause for a moment and ask are there any questions at this point? Can I ask one question? Mm -hmm. uh, so you uh, said that uh, output of computation is a linear function of measurement result, and the measurement yeah. angle is a linear function of uh, previous measurement result. Uh, is it only for cluster state or more yes, general? It is. It is. Well, at least it's not for every state you could that you could think of. So for the AKLT state, uh, it is considerably more complicated, at least in two dimension. Now for the cluster state. One dimension, two dimension makes no difference, but still it's everything, everything's governed by parities, but uh, for AQRT states as computational resources, it's considerably more complicated. So can you specify which type of resource state satisfy this linear relation? Um, I would expect to find it in stabilizer states, whenever you have stabilizer states. So for example, uh, the toric code state has been considered as a resource for measurement-based quantum computation, not a very interesting resource. You know, there's very little computational power, but from this classical side processing perspective, it is the same. It's again, parities, and um, that comes from the stabilizer nature of the state. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, I can define some new measurement-based quantum computation whose measurement angle is computed with some nonlinear function of previous measurement results. Uh, but maybe this is not so useful. Or, uh, I don't know, but because of some linearity of quantum computing, maybe some linearity yeah. should be uh, uh, 
do you know anything about this type of? So, for example, do you know any resource state whose uh, measurement angle is computed uh, with by some nonlinear function? Well, I think you probably could uh, view the AKRT state in this in this uh, way. Ah, uh, really? Or oh, AKRT case? But it uh, is, or maybe it's even. I don't know. I the, the the AKRT discussion is very complicated, at least in two dimensions, because there is there's a random aspect. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a percolation phenomenon going on there. Um, but maybe I can say uh, the the point of all this adaption business is always um, is always to 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 counter. Oops, what happened here? To counter uh, the effect of randomness of measurement outcomes. So this is always what you have to deal with, and. Uh, so in, in certain resource state, namely in stabilizer states, it takes this, it has this effect of, um, of the insertion of Pauli byproduct operators. But that is restricted to stabilizer states. And there, there can be other situations with other states. Mm -hmm. So for two-dimensional AKT case, uh, measurement based quantum computation is non-deterministic in the sense that with some probability you fail. Computation. Uh, in so the, the AKT states, you mean? Yeah, two dimensional case, if I remember correctly. Uh, that is you... correct. That is correct. It's a percolation phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you are small, I mean, whatever that means, small, if you're finite, there is a probability of failure. Yes. Oh, do you think if we uh, require the computation is deterministic? In that case, maybe this uh, relation should be linear. I have really not thought about this angle. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Okay. So you see, um, oh, I need to speak faster. Good. Let's let's see what I'm actually able to, to convey today. But let's talk a, lot, a bit about symmetry protected phases of quantum matter, uh, um, symmetry protected phase of quantum matter and computation in such phases. So this, the, the new element here is the following. So we are looking at ground states of Hamiltonians, AKLT was already an example of this, in the presence of symmetry. So our spin chain or lattice uh, has a certain symmetry. Um, we're looking at ground states, so zero temperature and our lattice. So far, everything that has been considered is two-dimensional or one-dimensional, all right? So uh, the, all the previous talk was about a cluster state, which is we can view as embedded in a symmetry-protected topological phase. And so now what we want to do is we want to move away from this fixed point into the phase and see how the computational power changes. And the interesting thing is that uh, it doesn't change. So typically in symmetry protected phases, the computational power is constant throughout the phase. I mean, with, with minor correction, the, what, what you can do with a cluster state, you can do anywhere in this phase, okay? And so this is the phenomenon that, that I wanna explain a little bit and really that quite a bit or almost everything about the computational scheme of measurement based computation follows from symmetry considerations. Okay, so, so why, why are we interested in this question? And so our motivation is, is the following question, and that is uh, epitomized by the SPT to MBQC meat grinder. I will explain to you later what this is, but for now, the question is the following. So can measurement-based schemes, measurement-based uh, schemes of quantum computation uh, be classified by symmetry in a similar way, say, that elementary particles can. And if that were the case, then does this have any bearing on quantum algorithms? Yeah, so this is, this is these are the questions, our short-term questions, our long-term questions. So this is really what we wanna inquire about. And computational phase of quantum matter allow us to do this. And that's why we're interested in that. 
Okay, so here's a bit of a history on the subject. So this all began with Akimasa Miyake. He wrote the first paper on this subject. And his uh, model was not uh, measurement-based computation proper. It was um, a, a hybrid of measurement-based quantum computation and uh, adiabatic quantum computation. And so let me tell you a little bit about that scheme. So what he was looking at was a spin chain, ground state of some Hamiltonian. So that's the kind of condensed matter part. And so now the measurement based part is, again, he proposed to measure the spin of the spin of the spin of the spin. But so normally when interaction was present, the measurement would excite the chain. And so the, to prevent that before the measurement, the coupling between the qubit on the edge and the nearest neighbor would, would be adiabatically to and off. So that's the adiabatic part. Okay, so that was uh, his computational scheme. And he showed that this computation relied on symmetry alone. You, so you didn't need to know any details of what the ground state was like and so on and so forth. All you needed to know uh, was that a certain symmetry was present. And as soon as this symmetry was present, the computation would function. Yeah? And on the spot, he realized that this functioning of this computational scheme is related to symmetry protect topological order. Okay. So that was the beginning. First or next waypoint uh, 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 on this line of research is a paper from Sydney from uh, Andrew Doherty and Stephen Bartlett's group. So this is phenomenologically, what phenomenologically, phenomenology wise, less, it only talks about shuttling uh, quantum information across spin chains. There's no processing. It's just kind of transmission of quantum information. Um, again, so it's, uh, and again, that works, the authors showed anywhere in a symmetry protected topological phase. It doesn't have to be, Cluster state is if it's the cluster phase, it works anyway. Good. So less phenomenology, but this is now measurement-based scheme proper. Okay, but the reason that this paper is really important uh, is that uh, it imported the group cohomology techniques for reasoning about SPT phases from condensed matter physics into quantum computation. So the, the condensed matter physicists already knew it and uh, this paper imported that knowledge into our field. And really this, uh, this reasoning has stuck with us ever since. So there is a, uh, an under the hood item. I wanted to go into this result in a, in a slightly greater detail, but I'm afraid I'm, I must move on. I'm afraid that I will not have the time to talk about it, but technically it is a very beautiful result. Good, next waypoint. Uh, now, so I, I told you that the Bartlett result had this drawback of not talking about computation. It was only about shuttling information. So this was fixed by Miyake and Miller again, Miller and Miyake. Um, so they demonstrated again in one dimension, the first uh, computational phase uh, on a spin chain. So, so it was a symmetry protected the topological phase where every ground state had the same computational power. Mm -hmm. Good. So now I come to the SPT to MPQC meat grinders, and it's a generalization of, uh, of the previous results. So Miyake and Miller, they showed this for one phase, but it turns out this is a pretty generic situation. So you start with a mathematical description um, of your symmetry protected topological phase. So this is the symmetry group, and then something called the group co-cycle. I don't want to go very much into it. It's a very neat mathematical description. It fully describes your symmetry protected phase in 1D. Okay, so you, you put this into the SPT to MBQC meat grinder and out comes a scheme of measurement-based quantum computation. So, so this gives us a classification of measurement-based schemes of computation by symmetry, which is good. This is what we are really happy about. The flip side is that this works only in dimension one. Our arguments apply only 
to spin chains. And this is a little bit of a drawback or considerable drawback. Okay, so um, maybe uh, I can explain the Bartlett paper and our paper here uh, at once. Let me look a little bit under the hood. So what the Bartlett paper showed is the following. So you have the cohomological description of SPT phases. And the Bartlett paper showed that from this information, you can extract the byproduct operators of measurement-based computation. And so they are, uh, they are constant throughout the phase. They're unitary and constant throughout the phase. So this is what they showed. Uh -huh. And um, okay, so now what we showed then uh, in turn is that, this, that these byproduct operators, they fully define um, the scheme of computation. So they give you the power, the computational power. Okay, and this is taken together. This is a little bit funny. So when we talked about the byproduct operators first, they entered the game as a nuisance. So a complication that can fortunately be dealt with. And now from this other perspective, they become the central object uh, that governs MBQC computational power. And that's an interesting change of perspective. Good. I just want to mention this very, very quickly. Um, so everything I told you so far is about one dimension. And the problem with one dimension is when you map measurement-based computation to the circuit model, you lose one spatial dimension. So for 1D systems, for spin chains, this means that you're dealing with a constant number of qubits. Yeah? So you have a, your circuit model equivalent is on a constant number of qubits. And so you cannot be universal. You cannot grow the number of qubits in your quantum register. So to have an arbitrary number of logical qubits to work with, you need to go to two dimensions. And indeed, in two dimensions, a phase, and by now a few phases have been constructed that are universal for measurement-based quantum computation. So the first phase of those, uh, and this is shared by all the subsequent ones, is a phase with subsystem symmetry. So here's your lattice. And the symmetry acts in this fashion. So you have these lines of Pauli operator sigma x, uh, south, east, south, west to northeast, and the other way around. And you have all these trends, all the translates are also symmetries. So this is this, this is subsystem symmetry. Okay, this is a this is part of the characterization of the phase. The other part is that the cluster state is inside the phase, and the phase that is thereby described is universal for quantum computation throughout. Good. So the reason I'm mentioning this is that in two dimensions, you, you can have universal, you can have SPT phases that are universal for measurement-based quantum computation, it's something you cannot have in spatial dimension one. Okay, so that's a good thing about two dimensions, but kind of in terms of classification, we know very, very little in dimension two. Good. Okay, so that is uh, the end of this review on this uh, subject of um, the computational phases of quantum matter. And now I would like, in this, in this final part of my talk, I'd like to, to talk about something new, uh, which is really what I haven't talked uh, about yet. And this is a, a gauge theory of measurement-based quantum computation. I should say that this is one D only at this moment, but hopefully can can be generalized. Yeah, so here's a bit, here's a word of motivation. So, uh, uh, so the general motivation uh, is the following. So when we look back at the uh, computational phases of quantum matter discussions, the part of the talk that I have just reviewed, um, and this is not complete, yeah? So this is ongoing research. research. But what we, what we know so far, is the following, that um, MBQC computational power is determined by symmetry. So if I, if I have a certain SPT phase and this, this is defined by some algebraic information and the same algebraic information also tells me what the power of my MBQC scheme is. So this is the role of symmetry. But the funny thing is, that symmetry breaking also plays a role. 
namely uh, the symmetry defines the computational power that I have, but in order to harness this computational power, I need to break the symmetry. So what is breaking the symmetry is the measurement procedure. And without this, the measurements breaking the symmetry, I mean, without them failing to commute with the symmetry, I cannot compute. And so to harness, I mean, symmetry determines what the computational power is, but to harness it, um, uh, we need to break the symmetry. And this is a little bit funny to us, so, and I think it's not completely figured out what all of this means. But hopefully what it does say is that symmetry is an interesting concept for measurement-based quantum computation. And we want to get the complete picture on that front. And it seems that gauge symmetry is part of that picture. So this is our general motivation. And the concrete result that we have at this point is related to the MBQC elevator thought experiment that I spoke about at the beginning. So we have these linear classical processing relations, but we are missing the bird's eye view. And we think that this gauge angle adds this bird's eye view. So namely, um, so we can regard the measurement record uh, as a gauge field and the computational output or vector potential, if you like, and the computational output corresponds bitwise to holonomies of this gauge field. Okay, and so this, this is the one concrete result on this gauge theory picture of measurement-based quantum computation that we have so far uh, obtained, and I want to show it to you. So this is, this is what I want to do with the remainder of my talk. Okay, so first, um, I need to slightly modify the setting. This is, I apologize, this is a, a bit of a technicality, but I need to mention it. So I need to move from the chain, a cluster chain to a cluster ring. And, and the reason is that we have difficulty discussing boundary conditions at the moment. I mean, maybe my, my co-workers, Bartek uh, Czech um, and, and Gabriel Wong, maybe they would be comfortable about comfortable speaking about the chain but myself i'd rather speak about the ring because it doesn't have a boundary and that makes things a little bit easier okay but when um we are switching from a chain to a ring we are also losing the circuit model interpretation okay? and so we need to figure out first what type uh, of circuit model a ring, a computation on a ring corresponds to. Yeah? And this is the first thing uh, that we will do. And then I'll be comfortable working with the ring. And again, the point of doing all this is to get, get rid of the boundaries. Okay, so what, what is going on uh, if you have measurement-based quantum computation on the cluster ring? So, um, so here is uh, here's how this looks like in the matrix product state picture. I, I, very, I very much hope and kind of expect that you're familiar with the MPS picture of quantum states. So, so what you have here, it, so if you, if you leave out the green hats for now, um, you have a bunch of tensors sitting here and, and they describe a quantum state. So every vertical line uh, represents a physical particle spin uh, in the state. And then these edges linking the tensors, they are, they are called virtual indices and they are contracted. Okay, so, uh, so without the green hats here, this, is, this diagram represents a quantum state in the matrix uh, product picture. Okay, so now uh, what are these hats for? So these hats represent measurements um, of those physical particles. So the, the measurement, the post-measurement states are also um, uh, encoded by, by one leg tensors and they are contracted. Okay, so this diagram as a whole represents uh, measurement-based quantum computation uh, on, a, on a spin chain in one dimension. Okay, and so now that we, we have this diagram, we can regard the left, so this, this kind of 
index contraction on the left, we can regard this as a bell state preparation. Then, you know, so we have the, vir the so-called virtual space consists of one qubit here and one qubit over here. Okay, so there's a bell state preparation. Maybe I should write this. So this is logical qubit. Maybe I should virtual qubit. Virtual qubit one and here this is virtual qubit two. I hope you're familiar with, with the uh, with MBQC and the matrix product representation. But it's certainly helpful uh, for this slide. Okay, so there's two virtual qubits going on. Uh, the computation begins with a bell state preparation, and we have a gate sequence, and then there is a bell state projection. Okay, but now, now come the bipart operators. So I can rewrite this whole thing as um, all my measurements uh, having obtained the reference outcome zero. So this would, this would um, implement a unitary of interest. And then we have the byproduct operator and all the randomness of those measurement outcomes is contained in this byproduct operator. Byproduct operator I introduced earlier. And so now the bell projection with the byproduct operator combined is a bell measurement. So this is now the overall view that we have for MBQC on a ring. We can view it as bell state preparation, um, applying a unitary only to one of the logical qubits and then performing a bell measure. So this is, yeah, so this is it. So this is the, the subject. This is our, the object that we study. And again, the one thing that we gain is we don't have to deal with boundaries. Okay. And so this byproduct operator is in fact what is being measured. So it has this form, uh, Pauli operator sigma x raised to a bit value, Pauli operator sigma z raised to a bit value. And these two bits is what is being output. Good. Okay. So now um, these the, these outputs are probabilistic. Let me not go into these. They're typically pro probabilistic, and the corresponding probabilities depend on what the unitary implemented is. Okay. Maybe this is too much detail. The more detail that you want to know, but then you want to know. But I still wanted to mention. It. Okay. So this is roughly what's going on. And um, also, we again there are these. Classical side processing relations. We want to know uh, these two bits of output. So remember, these were our bits of output. They appear in, in those parities. Okay, so, so these are the bits of output. And here is how they are obtained in terms of the individual measurement outcomes. And I hope you have this byproduct operator picture from earlier in the talk in the back of your mind. Okay, so one bit of output is the parity of all the measurement outcomes on the even bits. And the other uh, bit of output is the, uh, uh, is the sum of the measurement outcomes from all the odd locations. Yeah. So this is how the computational output is obtained in, in terms of uh, the measurement record in this example. So now we, we are moving towards the gauge picture. And there's one thing that I want to remind you of, and that's just the cluster state stabilizer. So here's the cluster state stabilizer on a ring, and uh, it has the following stabilizer. We pick any qubit, and the stabilizer generator looks like this. Now they have a Pauli operator sigma x on that qubit, and Pauli operator z on the nearest neighbors. So the stabilizer is the tensor product of these three Paulis. And then the cluster state itself is the eigenstate of that operator uh, with eigenvalue plus one. Okay, and so you have a constraint on this form for all these other cluster state stabilizers that are that are centered around the other qubits. Okay, so the chain here, oops, is translation invariant, and so you have all these these translates. The translates of this, they are also 
uh, cluster state stabilizers and lead to a constraint like this. And all the constraints together define the cluster state. Okay, good. I just wanted to review cluster state is a stabilizer state, and this is what the stabilizer look like. Okay, so now related to that, so, so we will use those stabilizer relations very soon. Um, so let me talk again about this adaption of measurement outcome, measurement basis business. So the observables that we measure in, me in measurement based quantum computation out of this form. So they are linear combinations of sigma x and sigma y. Uh, yeah, so there's a rotation angle involved, sorry, a measurement angle involved. And then there is this bit basis adjustment value Q involved. Yeah, and I've shown you this picture before. Okay, and so now we wanna, we wanna see what happens when we conjugate the observables that are being measured on the Pauli operator sigma x and Pauli operator sigma z, you see? When we conjugate on poly operator X, uh, kind of we are flipping Q equals zero and Q equals one. And when we conjugate on the poly operator sigma Z, you know, both X and Y acquire a minus sign, then we keep the basis, but we are flipping the basis states. So this means uh, the measurement outcome is being flipped. So conjugation under X flips Q, Conjugation on the Z flips the measurement outcome S. Okay, so we keep that in mind. We have, uh, uh, we, we have written it again here. And so now we also remember the, the shape of the stabilizer. So now we do the following. So we're looking at expectation values for the cluster state. This is just the simplest possible ex, um, expression that uh, uh, shows me uh, what is going on here. So we're looking at the expectation value of the locally measured observables. Okay, and so since this is the stabilizer, we can pull out the stabilizers on, on both sides uh, of the sandwich, and now conjugate these observables under the stabilizer and, and use these relations that we have previously identified. And so what this means is, and this is an equivalence transformation. We've just pulled out a stabilizer from the stabilizer state. So no physical action happening. And so what we see here is that, um, so this, there's a, a transformation, uh, an equivalence transformation that acts on the measurement record and it acts on those variables Q that determine the measurement basis, okay? And so namely at the side J itself, the measurement basis is flipped because the conjugation under X and on the neighboring side, the measurement outcome is flipped because of the conjugation under Z. Okay, good. So this is an equivalence transformation. Nothing's really happening here, but the measurement record is affected and those variables uh, that govern the measurement basis are affected. So these measurement bases, those measure, those uh, transformations are local and they preserve the classical processing relations. Good. Okay, and so now we want to come to a, I, I believe that I have five minutes and I think I can, I can do with those five minutes. Um, and so now we want to give a cohomological interpretation to these uh, equivalence transformations. Yeah. And so what we do is we take our cluster state as described by an interaction graph and map it to two chain complexes, a primal chain complex and a dual chain complex. And so <clears throat> what we now see when we go to either of these chain complexes is that part of the qubit locations have become sites in the complex and part of uh, the qubit locations have become edges. And when we look at the dual complex, it's, it's kind of the other way around. Uh, so what is a site in the primal complex is an edge in the dual complex, okay? And so we now, um, we now write our measurement record and these variables governing the adjustment of measurement basis as chains 
on those complexes. So, so we split up. Uh, so basically, uh, the measurement record ends up on the edges on, on either complex. And so, um, yeah, so we need to split up the measurement record in, in an S part and an S bar part. So the S bar part is, is a one co chain uh, on the dual complex, and the S part is a one co chain on, uh, on the primal complex. Okay, and so for, the, for those variables that govern the adoption of measurement bases, uh, they are located on the sides, on the sides. So we split it up into a piece that ends up on the sides of uh, the primal chain complex and there's a part Q bar that ends up on the sides of the dual complex. Okay, and uh, so, Oh yeah, and then there's gauge transformation. So there is a so the so the action of these stabilizers, which uh, generates uh, our gauge, gauge transformations, also has uh, a description in this picture. So this is so the gauge transformations are also located uh, on the sides of the two complexes. So they are zero co-chains. Okay. And so now it turns out with this new language introduced, we can rewrite those gauge transformations in a cohomological fashion. And so what happens under these gauge transformations is that we have this gauge transformations lambda here, it's located on the sites uh, of the primal and the dual complex. And uh, so whenever we have such a transformation, the variables that govern the, the adjustment of measurement bases, they are offset by the transformation itself. And the measurement record is offset by the co-boundary uh, of, of the gauge transformation. So, yeah. okay, so this is the same thing that is happening over here, but written in this cohomological notion. Good. And so final step in the argument, we now want to figure out what is invariant under these transformations, okay? So we want to find, say on the primal complex here, um, we want to find a one chain, which has the property that uh, under the change of gauge, it doesn't really change. Hmm? And so this requires that, uh, so for all co-boundaries of lambda applied to this, uh, one chain, we obtain zero, um, and the conclusion of so the conclusion of this is that uh, this chain that we use for the evaluation, the chain that has this property, we require that it it cannot have a boundary, it must be without a boundary, and so this means it's not just a chain, it is a cycle. Okay, and so then the measurement record uh, evaluated. Uh, on that cycle, that is the corresponding holonomy. And this holonomy is uh, a gauge invariant quantity. And we have the same thing on the dual complex. And so uh, now uh, comparing with what we had already established uh, in, in the standard picture, we identify the two bits of outputs that we have as the holonomies uh, of this. Uh, uh, of this gauge field on the primal and on the dual complex. Good. Okay, so this is now, this is the end of the argument. So uh, this is all related to this MBQC elevator thought experiment. And so what we have achieved at least in one dimension for, for now one dimension only, we have given the parities that occur that convert the measurement record into the computational output, we have given it a high level interpretation. Namely, we have identified, identified it with the holonomy of a gauge field. So I think that is, if this can be extended to two dimensions, I think that would be a very satisfactory uh, closure of this elevator thought experiment picture. But for now we have it only in one dimension. Good. Okay, so this concludes my talk and uh, also my time is up. So just 
a tiny bit of outlook. So for now, I mean, this area of computational phase of matter is very well developed. This is just beginning. Uh, I said, uh, this is really the first time I'm speaking about this. Okay, but we wanna develop this further. And once we have developed it further, we wanna combine these two angles. Huh? And let me point to a problem and a good sign. So the problem that immediately arises is that the arguments that I have presented hinge on the cluster state stabilizer. So even in the cluster phase, no state except the cluster state stabilizer, uh, except the cluster state itself has the cluster state stabilizer. So all the other states are not stabilizer states. So the arguments that I have presented, they do not generalize into the phase. However, a good sign is that we know that the classical processing relations, which this was all about, they do extend from the fixed point state into the entire surrounding SPT phase. So maybe there is a more refined set of arguments that can uh, take or that can introduce this gauge theory angle to the entire SPT phase. Good, okay, so this, is, uh, this remains for the future. Let me conclude. So uh, what I have uh, shown uh, to you today is that in dimension one so far, measurement-based quantum computation can be understood in terms of a gauge theory with a measurement record uh, as the gauge field and the computational output as the holonomy of the gauge field. Good, and uh, extension uh, in, into computational phase of matter is, well, this is an area of future work. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, David. Any question or comment? Oops. Um, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a question about you, about the second part of your talk. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I know how group cohomology works in classifying um, SPT phases in 1D and 2D, but mm -hmm. it, um, I don't understand how group cohomology appears in the measurement-based quantum computation. I guess I guess it's through it appears through uh, byproduct operators or something. Exactly. Yeah, but then. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. can you explain more about um, <clears throat> how uh, group homology determines the, the form of the byproduct operators of something? Okay, I would be happy to, to explain a little bit. I mean, I, I am not, um, uh, not the entire argument that leads to this result, but uh, the connection is given here in, in this theorem. So um, for the proof of the theorem, I, I refer you to uh, the paper from uh, Bartlett and Doherty's group. Mm -hmm. But let me, let me say, let me tell you what the result is, what the connection between all this group cohomology business and measurement-based quantum computation is. And um, so uh, before I can do that, I guess I have to talk a little bit about notation. So the central object in this theorem is, uh, is this, uh, this matrix here. So what is it? So I, I, I already taught, excuse me? Um, a, a is a matrix of MPs. Yeah, a, a of I is a matrix uh, uh, of the MPS. And so, you know, here, um, here is the A without the I in brackets is the MPS tensor itself. And now A of I is this tensor contracted on the physical leg. Yeah. So we, we take a basis state, for a certain basis, and I'll talk about that basis. Um, anyway, we contract it with the basis state from that basis, and that gives us A of I. So this is what the object is, okay? And now what I still need to talk about is the basis in which this is done. For this is not any basis, it's a very special basis. And I have called it here the symmetry respecting basis. Um, and what this means is, um, well, the, the symmetry has an on-site action. And uh, so the basis states here, they are eigenstates of this on-site action of the symmetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To give you an example, 
So we know for the cluster phase, we know how the, there's a Z2 plus Z2 symmetry. And uh, this is what it looks like. No, I'm just to draw, I'm just uh, showing you here the, the two generators of the symmetry. Yeah. These are the two generators of the symmetry. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the, the, the symmetry acts by the identity of sigma x on, uh, on the physical legs. And so the symmetry respecting basis in this example here would be the eigenbase of sigma x. Huh? So the basis that, um, that these states are eigenstates of. So far so good? Yep. Good, okay, so now I have to find the object that we are talking about. And so it turns out, and this is now what, uh, what Bartlett and company, uh, Dominic Allison company have shown is the following, that um, this matrix here, it has a, is a tensor part of two pieces or can be written uh, as a tensor part of two pieces uh, uh, upon suitable choice uh, of basis here on the virtual legs. And the first part, is the bipart operator, mm -hmm. and the other part is called the junk. And so about the bipart operator part, we know that it is unitary and that it is constant throughout the phase. So at any point in the phase, this operator is exactly the same. It doesn't change as I move about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I know everything about it. And then there is this other part, which is the junk part of which I know nothing. It can be any matrix. I, I don't even know the dimension of this. Yeah, it can be anything. Um, but but the good thing is, so, so here I know nothing, here I know everything. And the good thing is that they are nicely separated uh, by this tensor product um, connection. Yeah, so they, they are, mm -hmm. I mean, the junk acts on one subsystem of the Hilbert space and the byproduct on the other. Okay, so that, that is this really nice separation. And from this, so the byproduct follows from this group cohomology description. So B I is somehow related to a physical edge state or something. B I is somehow related to the edge states you said? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not the most solid with with edge state, so I see, edge state. Um, uh, you know, um, Haltasaki is in the audience. Maybe I should hand the, the question over to him. It, it has something to do with edge states, but um, maybe I'm not the best to to explain that relation. I see. Hal, would you want to take it? No, uh, um, I don't think I have a quick answer. So I is the, I represent each site. Uh, oh, no, no. Um, I, I, so we are no, assuming no. translation and variance. So we assume everything is the same. Mm -hmm. I represents the, the basis state. Yeah. So if it was the X basis, there is eigenvalue plus one, eigenvalue minus one. So this is what I represents. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to note, it's very important to note that um, that this is a basis dependent relation, yeah? Because the the jump matrices they can differ from I to I. So when you measure in a different basis, you do not have this beautiful tensor product separation between the two. If you if you measure in another basis, the two parts become entangled. So what does BI look like uh, for say AKLT state? Uh, for the, EK, for the uh, AKLT state, yeah. the bond dimension would be three. And uh, so, so, so there is, is uh, yeah, so it's, been, it's been one state, so you have three outcomes. And so the Bs would be sigma X, sigma Y, sigma Z. Mm -hmm. Okay, and for the cluster state, um, if you're, the, the convention is to group two spins together into a block uh, of size, Two. And so then you'd have four byproduct operators and they would be X, Y, Z and the identity. But. Okay, I think. Yeah, pretty, pretty much like 
operator acting on edge state. Yeah, we can discuss. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be happy to, uh, yeah. to, to yeah, hear yeah. that discussion. I'd be really happy can, can, to yeah. hear can that I ask discussion. A, yeah. Can I ask a different question? You, as far as I'm concerned, yes. Who is uh, who is deciding? Yeah. And please go for it, Hal. Yeah, th thank you. It was a beautiful talk. And my question is sort of related. So here on this slide, you said this computational power within this symmetry protected topological phase is sort of constant. But of course, if you go near the boundary of SPT phase, sort of SPT order becomes sort of weaker and weaker. And you will go into gapless state, which have no computational power, for yes. example. Mm -hmm. So what, what, it, what, how does this reflect to this picture? Do you have yes. to go to larger and larger size or something like yes. that? Yes, yes, uh, something like that. So I, I apologize. Um, mm -hmm. I, I didn't choose my words very carefully. Uh, when I say the power is constant. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I'm just looking for a slide where I can just have, find some white space. Um, so uh, let me refine yeah. the statement. Um, so what is true, so suppose uh, this is the face, you know, and then there's other, other phases in the neighborhood and, and you've been talking about, you've been asking about, okay, so what happens here near the face boundary? Something, you, something should collapse near the face boundary. Right. Mm. Yeah. And so a, a better way to, 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 um, to, to say what's going to happen as you, as you move out uh, here towards the boundary, I mean, as long as you are not at the boundary, what is true is the, the group of gates that you can simulate. Yeah? So the, if you're mapping to the circuit model, the group of gates that you can simulate is the same everywhere in the face. So that, that is, statement is correct, but it is also true um, that uh, the, the computational power gets weaker uh, as you approach the boundary. And so what this is described by is two parameters. Uh, the most important parameter is uh, the string order parameter. Uh, I don't know, so we have some parameter Let's call it alpha, say this is cluster and this is product, okay? And so, I don't know, string order parameter, we can talk about definition later, but we know that we have a curve like this, goes down at the face boundary and then stays down. If you have a finite system, it's, it's uh, all smoothing out a little bit and also discuss those types of scenarios now. So um, the string order parameter is, is kind of important for this detail of computational strength. So um, the, um, um, the, 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 the smaller the string order parameter, um, the, the more the computation expands, the, the more, uh, I mean, the larger the whole computation gets. Yeah, so, so every gate will now take more space uh, if the string order parameter is smaller. Um, so this is, yeah, okay. So that's the main thing that is not all there is. There is also a correlation length that plays a role. So um, yeah, so uh, the fact that you, uh, um, uh, how shall I say this? Okay, so this is again, um, uh, let me see. We could, uh, there's still space. So, so we could think of, so this is our one dimensional system and the string order parameter would, would be some operator that looks like this. And then it has certain stuff at the endpoints. And let's say it is of length L. Okay. And so now plot the string order parameter versus the length L. So we will find that it, well, maybe for L equals zero, it starts at one and then it decreases. And well, it, it kind of settles on a characteristic length scale into its stationary value. When this characteristic length scale is also important uh, for the overhead of the computational scheme. So it is both this, this and, and, 
and the value of the string order param. That is yeah. what determines the actual okay. computational yeah. cost. And really, mm -hmm. as you approach mm -hmm. the boundary, well, mm -hmm. the order parameter gets weaker, this length scale increases, and that means that mm -hmm. your computation yeah. gets larger. Okay, thank you. It's very clear, but isn't this very one dimensional? So I, I think I would expect that the story would be very different in two dimensions, but um, we can talk it in coffee. Yes. I, this would be really, really interesting for, for me to hear your arguments because I think, um, um, no, I don't think that it is going to be different. However, please uh, let me remind you that what we can handle, I mean, maybe when you say it's gonna be very different, you, you think of, of global symmetry action. I don't know what you were thinking about. So what we can handle in dimension two is these subsystem symmetries. Hmm. And we believe that, um, and be happy to talk more about it if, if, you, if you have a, a way of, of talking, be, be really interested. I believe for this subsystem symmetry scenario that the situation is actually not that different in two dimensions. Although we haven't made that point in writing yet, but I, yeah, I would be super interested to hear your arguments uh, why you say that it's going to be different. Uh -huh. Well, I'm simply thinking about size dependence or something like that. Uh, I mean, say it if again? you consider size dependence of the computational power. Mm -hmm. So in one dimensional case, if you make L larger and larger, I think you, your computational ability stays constant. If your L is sufficiently large, then you can simulate several gates, but isn't that the end? So if you make it longer and longer, do you get more power in one dimension? I mean, you, you can, yeah. So kind of the, the, the number of gates you can simulate is proportional to the length ah. or the size of ah, the ring okay. or the length of the chain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, probably I have to think about this. Yeah, no, I'd be very happy. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, to be confronted with different trains of thought to, mm -hmm. to, to kind of to check against our own arguments. Mm -hmm. Be very interested in your intuition on the two dimension of this. And actually we have to discuss about gauge symmetry, but <laughs> that's our main topic. But, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but can, can we go on or? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. be happy to. I mean, I don't so know what the plan is for the seminar. There, there was virtual coffee. The email said that there would be virtual coffee. I have some coffee here. So I'm, I'm ready for the discussion session. Good. Yeah, no, I'd be very happy. As far as I'm concerned, I don't know what the overall plan is for this format, but I'd be happy to take questions. Very much so. So if I understand correctly, uh, coffee time is in another so is that right, Nagada-san? Um, yes, um, so actually uh, we're going to have a kind of um, time for chatting in the uh, spatial chat. So it's so in maybe, a, um, another website. Yeah, so maybe um, before we do that uh, platform, uh, let's uh, finish this uh, Zoom session. Uh, is there any link for this? Uh, so uh, if you look at the chat, chat box of the Zoom, um, I already wrote down the, the URL for the okay. um, coffee time session. Okay, so, so maybe before, before going to that, uh, I uh, would like to ask another question here. Is there any question or comment? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, but yeah, this, well, I, I think this is a question that everybody had. So this gauge symmetry argument is, I think, very beautiful, but you only, you, you only show this for the cluster state where you have these stabilizers. So yes. is it, isn't it possible that this gauge symmetry is some emergent uh, property that you only see in some sort of fixed point state like cluster state and you don't have exact gauge symmetry for other states in the phase? Yeah, well, my collaborators in particular, and but also myself, I believe 
that it will extend. I mean, we cannot use the same arguments, but we believe that it somehow will extend. And so kind of what the gauge theory does is it covers the long range physics, mm. not the short so, range physics. Uh -huh. So that's that the kind of our of the uh -huh. hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, thank you. But it's really just <laughs> unsubstantiated at this moment. We, we, I cannot say anything beyond the cluster point, <clears throat> definitely at this moment. But this is related to the question by Tomoyuki at the beginning of the talk that you, you had re linear relation for special limited class of uh, measurement based quantum computation, and that's not general was what Tom, Tomoyuki pointed out. Yeah, but we do know, I mean, that is the thing that we do know. Mm -hmm. um, okay. When we okay. move into the phase, the classical yeah. side processing doesn't change. Okay. That we do know. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of the thing that gives us hope that these results might be extendable, although we don't know yet how. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, can I ask you a question? Uh, I, I'm wondering, uh, so this may be a silly question, but can you extend this idea to uh, uh, error, error correction? Because uh, I, I think that uh, MBQC is somehow related to uh, uh, error correction, quantum error correction, and you can, uh, you, you can introduce uh, also uh, Stabilizers, uh, you, you know, uh, you can describe it actually in terms of stabilizers. So, uh, uh, I, I, my intuition is that you can extend this uh, whole, whole idea to uh, error correction. It, yes. Um, yeah. So there is a really a very natural intersection point. Yeah, and th this would be measurement-based quantum computation in three dimensions. Yeah. So we know. I mean, uh, we know that. In that setting, uh, we have full error correction capability. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, so we could go, what we have right now is one dimension, maybe next thing we can figure out is dimension two. And then once we figure that out, we can go to dimension three. And then error correction would indeed be included. So, I mean, uh, there's, a, there's a way of approaching your question. Um, but we haven't done it yet. So why you have to extend to it this formalism to three three dimension to extend it to error correction? How, well, I, I don't... We, we know that um, error correction. Uh, so 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 um, MBQC in one D is neither universal nor fault tolerant. Uh, right. And uh, if you go to two D, it's universal. Fault tolerance exists, threshold is terrible. So you go to three dimensions, cluster states in three dimensions have a very kind of high threshold, simple scheme for fault tolerance. And that comes with the third dimension. I see. That, okay, thank you. Please talk me. Can I ask a question? Please. So, um, so related to this uh, one, the uh, restriction on stabilizer states, do you have uh, any candidate for non-stabilizer SPT states or, or like uh, SPT phase in which the byproduct is not parties? Um. The latter, not, and maybe this is a consequence of the setting that we are, that we are uh, considering. So kind of um, the symmetry groups that we have so far been considering, they, they were always powers of Z2. Mm -hmm. And in that case, the byproduct operators end up being powers. Um, so, um, 
I have nothing beyond that. So for the second part of the question, for your first part of the question, do we have uh, SPT phases where, or systems where they, that do not look stabilizer-like at all? And there we have a little bit. So something that we recently uh, looked at is the Kitayev gamma chain. So the Kitayev gamma chain is a fairly large symmetry group, but uh, it has a Z2 times Z2 subgroup. And so we can do the analysis that we know how to do. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so uh, um, as a tiny detail, we need to dimerize the Kitayev gamma chain so that we have a gap, so that we have finite correlation length. Uh, but yeah, so then uh, that's a system I figure fairly different from cluster states, and it still has the same computational power. Can, can I ask one more quick question? Yes. Uh, it is yeah. pretty naive, but do you expect that the you know, relation between computational power of S, no, SPT phase and uh, MVQC resource is kind of one-to-one, -one, not just one direction? At least in 1D, and suppose we have a gap to ground states, which is capable of 1D quantum wire, then do you believe that that state is in some one 1D SPT state? Okay, whether the presence of computation, the existence of computational wire uh, means that we are in, uh, in an SPT phase? Um, I wouldn't, I'm not sure. I, I cannot make a definite statement. But um, maybe not. I, I don't know. I cannot make a definite statement. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I think it's what Barton and company have shown and kind of, this is also the lines along which we are thinking. You, you start with the symmetry protected phase and that gives you the wire or the computation. Whether the, the conclusion goes the other way around, as you are suggesting, that I don't know. I really cannot speak about it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other question or comment? Okay. So if not, uh, let's thank Global again. Thank you.